If you want to follow along, turn to Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations chapter 3. Now, if you so desire, if you are so moved, you can also, for next week, Lord willing, take a look at chapter 2 and verse 14, but do so in light of the context of the book of Lamentations. But for this morning, Lamentations chapter 3, I'm not going to read anything yet. <coughs> Let me just lay a little foundation. In chapter 1 of the book of Lamentations, Jeremiah writes in real time as to Judah and Jerusalem's affliction. That is, when Jeremiah, and I don't, I'm not talking about the specific time that he necessarily wrote it down, but he was writing these things down as the events were taking place. That's the way you gather when you read the book of Lamentations. It's not as though Jeremiah wrote this years later. Yeah, exactly. It was as though it, it, you, you get the, the idea that it's, it was happening at the very time. So in chapter 1, Jeremiah writes, In real time of Judah and Jerusalem's affliction. What amazed me as I read chapter 1 was that Jeremiah also confesses a present complicity with Judah and Jerusalem. And you can take time, I'm not going to go back and read it, but you can take time and you look specifically, well, let me just do it. Chapter 1, verses 18 through 22. Remember now, you read, when you read the book of Lamentations, you read Jeremiah's writing as in real time of the afflictions of Judah and Jerusalem. It's a lot of it is in present tense, is what I mean when he writes these things. But look at this, verse 18. The Lord is righteous for I. Do you see that? This amazed me when I read this. For I have rebelled against his commandment. Here I pray you all people. And behold my sorrow. My virgins and my young men are gone into captivity. I called for my lovers, but they deceived me. My priests and my elders gave up the ghost in the city. That is, they died. While they sought their meat to relieve their souls. Behold, O Lord, for I am in distress. My bowels are troubled. Mine heart is turned within me, for I have grievously rebelled. Do you see that? That amazed me when I read that. But then I realized that even then, Jeremiah recognized this truth. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Of God. Amen. Jeremiah realized that by nature he was not a cut above anyone. Yeah. You understand that? Exactly. Jeremiah experienced that truth. Yes, I don't believe it to be just a doctrine to Jeremiah. It's a doctrine to a lot of people. Well, we've all sinned. Oh, yeah. Well, we're all the same. Yeah. You know, that flippant kind of, well, yeah. it, it, you know, it's. It, it's it's, we're all human. We're all human. No, Jeremiah confesses a present complicity with even the people of God. Yes, sir. In chapter 1. Now in chapter 2, Jeremiah continues with Zion's misery and the judgment of God which God had brought her to. That's what he continues on with this. Writing, though, Writing, though, with empathy with Zion. Even when he continues to write of Judah and Jerusalem, of Zion's misery and affliction, he's not writing as though he's up here writing or speaking down to them. Yeah. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? He writes with great empathy and compassion toward the people of God. I have trouble with that. I have trouble with that. Right. I confess to you, I have trouble with that. Not trouble with the fact that Jeremiah was that way. I have trouble being that way at times. Because yeah. how often do I forget we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God? 
but how much more often do I forget I have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Exactly. And I just bring that out because that's the context. If you read the book of Lamentations in any other way, you're going to miss the whole thrust of the book of Lamentations. Jeremiah's Lamentations are not, I told you so. Exactly. And you should have, but you didn't. <laughs> He basically says, I told you so, and we have. Amen. <laughs> I told you so, and we have. He writes with great empathy with sign. Now the point is, not every Israelite, not every Jew in Judah and Jerusalem was one of the elect. But the very fact that there were some who were the elect is why Jeremiah could write with such empathy because in truth we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How could the prophet who constantly warned Judah and you go back and read the book of Jeremiah you'll actually read the account of all these warnings. How could the prophet who constantly warned Judah and Jerusalem, who was so ill-treated by even Judah and Jerusalem, who was mocked, ostracized, and even imprisoned at one time. Was he not? Even imprisoned. How could he be so empathetic? How could he really be that empathetic? Was it just some doctrine that he learned and he figures, well, I need to be? You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Is it just, he, and I, I don't say this to be flippant or funny, but did he, did he merely learn it in Sunday school? Therefore, when he got older, that's just the way he was? Mm -mm. No. A lot of people are like that. A lot of people will talk about, well, we're, we're all sinners. We're, we're all, you know, we're all deserve the judgment of God. But why? Simply because they were taught that academically when they were young. They know it as a doctrine only. Jeremiah has real, bona fide, personal reason and a personal experience. This is why he could write in such a way. Amen. This is how the prophet could, though he's constantly warned you, to, warned them over and over. He said, your wall won't stand. The wall of Jerusalem won't stand. God's going to send in judgment. And they mocked him and ridiculed him and even at one time imprisoned him. The reason is, is because the Lord had humbled Jeremiah. Yes, sir. Previously, yeah. before any of this had happened. Look at chapter 3. <coughs> I am the man. Do you see that? Oh, what a blessing it is for yeah. God to bring you to realize I am the man. Yeah. And this is not a boastful I am the man. This is though this is like what happens when you hear someone preaching the gospel and you're in a crowd of two or three or four hundred people and that's almost like the, then you realize did God tell that preacher something about me? Exactly. He's talking about me. Yeah. People have got angry at Earl, myself, Joe, at others, many other gospel preachers. Why is he exposing me? No, I'm exposing us. Exactly. But when God brings it home to you, for you to realize, I am the one. You see it? Just that. I am the man that has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. Amen. He hath led me and brought me into darkness, but not to light. Amazing words, isn't yes, it? Sir. Think about that. Most of the time, what we concentrate on is being brought out of darkness in the light. Yep. Jeremiah here says he brought me into darkness, but not in the light. Surely against me is he turned. He turneth his hand against me all the day. You see it? My flesh and my skin hath he made old. He hath broken my bones. Notice how the book, J Jeremiah laments. He cries, tears of affliction for the misery of his people but Jeremiah's going through it too. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yes, 
Jeremiah's going through it too. But Jeremiah, as he goes through it, he can recall, as he will say, he can look back and say, I've went through something like this before. Uh -huh. And when he went through it before, he went through it personally and individually. Until, and until you go through it personally and individually, you have no idea how to experience it collectively with the people of God. Amen. Now, I've just basically preached my message. But look what it says. He hath builded against me and compassed me with gall and travail. He hath set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. He hath hedged me about that I cannot get out. He hath made my chain heavy. We don't think of it in that way usually, do we? Do we? Every one of God's people, though, can relate to this when they hear this, can't you? Every one of if you've been if you've been given life by God, and more important, if you've been converted by God Almighty through the gospel, you can relate to what Jeremiah is saying right here. Amen. Also, when I cry and shout, he shutteth out my prayer. He hath enclosed my ways with hewn stone. That is, he meant to do this. Exactly. He hath made my paths crooked. He was unto me as a bear lying in wait and as a lion in secret places. He hath turned aside my ways and pulled me in pieces. He hath made me desolate. He hath been his bow and sent me as a mark for the arrow. In other words, I was in his sights. He hath caused the arrows of his quiver to enter into my reins. I was a derision to all my people. And their song all the day. He hath filled me with bitterness. He hath made me drunken with wormwood. He hath also broken my teeth with gravel stones. He hath covered me with ashes. And thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forget prosperity. And I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord, remembering my affliction and my misery and the, the wormwood and the gall. And you think, oh, what a horrible place to be in. Yep. Oh, what a blessed place to have been brought. Amen. Uh, Amen. What a blessed place to have been brought. But look. Lamentations is not all lamentations. It is lamentations, but it's not all lamentations. My soul hath them still in remembrance. Now, I'm not going through all of this over again, but my soul hath them still in what? Remembrance. This is something Jeremiah said, this happened to me back yonder. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? And I read one man. I don't know. I, I do know him. I read one man studying on another subject. He said, now, saints back yonder, they didn't have any conversion experience. <laughs> That's sad. That's sad because I, it makes me wonder, can you, can you read this and not relate to this? Having been a converted person in this dispensation too? Yes, sir. And say, I can relate to that man even in that dispensation? And I'm using their words, mind you. Yeah. Oh. Huh? I know what Jeremiah is talking about. Yes, sir. My soul hath them still in remembrance. And here's where I get my text from, or my, my title, and is humbled in me. What I'm talking about is the confession of a humbled soul. Look, this I recall to mind, therefore have I hope. Amen. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now notice he's changed. Now he's, yeah. now, now he's just recalling. Now he's talking we. Yes, sir. Because he remembers me. Yeah. Himself back young. You see what I'm saying? Exactly. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. We even sing a song like, with that word. Mm -hmm. The Lord is my portion. An amazing statement. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Amen. Have you ever wondered, but yet your soul says the Lord's my portion. <laughs> yeah. 
Have you ever said, I, I, I doubt myself. But your soul says to you, soul, yeah. the Lord's your portion. Yes, uh -huh. yeah. you, ever had, you ever talk to your soul and then ever had your soul talk back to you? Yeah. Uh -huh. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. That is his spirit, as Joe, that is his spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Yes, my soul, my soul, the Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. Yeah. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. There's a whosoever. Yes, sir. There's a whosoever right yes, there, isn't it? It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Uh, Jeremiah felt compassion with the people of God, even midst the present calamity, because Jeremiah knew something about what it was like to have God reveal to him what he really was by nature. Yes, sir. I believe it happened way back yonder when God took him to him and told him, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Amen. I believe it happened somewhere along that. Can I prove that absolutely? No, I cannot, but I believe that's probably when it happened. But no, but this one thing I can prove, because Jeremiah says it, it happened to Jeremiah. Yes, sir. And it happened to Jeremiah before what happened to Judah and Jerusalem. Because when it happened to Judah and Jerusalem, while he confessed a complicity, he still had an empathy with Zion. Why? Because I've been there myself. Exactly. That's it. I've been there myself. Truly, this is number one, truly, humbling, humbling is God's work. Yes, sir. Listen to me. And I'll say it another way this time. James said concerning the word of God, by which we are begotten. Yep. Begotten by the truth, right? Yes. By which we are begotten. That means actually birthed. Mm -hmm. Actually birthed. Be slow to speak. Mm -hmm. Slow to wrath, but swift to what? What? Hear. Yeah. Hear. In other words, listen to God's word. It's not about listening to me per se, yeah. although God has ordained it to come this way. Yep. But it's not about listening to me, but it's hearing the word of God and receive with meekness the engrafted word that's able to save your soul. Because you're going to be saved by the word of God or you won't be saved at all. Amen. It's not going to come as some mysterious thing that kind of lights on you. That revelation, Joe, is of Christ and by Christ, but it's going to come through the word of God. Amen. I mean, even when, even when Abraham was called, God came down and spoke with him. Yes, sir. Did he not? Yes, sir. Yeah. He still heard it by words. Yes, sir. By words. So listen, what I'm about to say. I'm not saying that the way I've said this before is wrong. But I want to clarify, to make sure there's no misunderstanding. Before I say it, be turning to Romans chapter 8. We speak, and I say we, not because I got a mouse in my pocket, but I say we because others say this too, have said it, and I may still say it on occasion, but I want to make sure there's no misunderstanding. We speak of a law work, and rightfully so. Romans 8, verse 15, now look at what it says. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again Amen. to fear. Amen. We did receive a, a, a spirit of bondage. Yes, sir. Jeremiah is testifying of it, exactly. isn't he not? Amen. A spirit of bondage came upon Jeremiah, was it not? But here Paul saying, that's done. That's a, that's a finished work. We have not received the spirit of a bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Do you see that in Jeremiah? Yes. Even though Jeremiah did not know that doctrine, he'd experienced that truth. Amen. You see what I'm saying? Yes, sir. You see what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Because he goes from the bondage and no hope. Yeah. Right? No hope. Yeah. Yeah. To finding hope in the Lord himself. Amen. Do you see that? Amen. And it's like a different story now, Joe. God's my papa. Amen. My father. Now we speak of a law work. Experienced bondage comes first. 
I'm not going to read it, but you go to Romans 7, verses 7 through 13. Paul talks of his experience. Yes, sir. Well, I, I mean, I'm going to have to read it. <laughs> because I, I just I can't remember it well enough to, 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 to get to the point. But look at it. verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Is there some flaw in the law? Exactly. God forbid. Amen. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For, had, for I had not known lust except the law had said thou shalt not covet. This is the natural barrier. We don't know sin defined until God sends some message to us and said right here is what sin is. Yeah. That's what the law does. Yeah. It says this, the, if you do this right here, that's a sin. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, if you don't do this right here, that's a sin. Amen. For I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. In other words, I am so depraved that even when I heard the message, all it did was turn me against that truth. Yeah. There was a part of me that every time I heard it, it wanted to rush against it. Yeah. To defy it. Yes, sir. Thou shalt not. Oh, yes, I will. Hmm? Yeah. yeah. The law says thou shalt not or thou shalt. And it says no I won't or yes I will. Exactly opposite to what the law says. Exactly. That, 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 e that evil concupiscence is in there. For without the law sin was dead. Mm -hmm. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came. Yeah. Now this man had had the law from his youth he said right? Yeah. yeah. But there was a time when the commandment came, and it's almost as if it dropped out of the sky on me. That's what he's saying. Yes, sir. Something, you know, something along that line. Oh, yeah. In other words, all of a sudden, it became real. I, I, I finally began to realize what it was really saying. Yeah. When the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. Well, I thought we was all born dead. We are, but Paul's talking about experiencing that death. Exactly. That's it. You see, I didn't fall when I was born. I was born fallen. Adam fell back yonder. But God brings every one of his people to experience that fall. You see what I'm saying? To come to know what the... Now I'm telling you, every one of them. Every one of them. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life... I found to be under what? Death. That's right. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become what? Not just sinful but exceeding sinful. Amen. In other words, Paul, actually Saul, I believe I would say, Saul of Tarsus, and Jeremiah, and myself, and you, if you're in Christ by work of grace through the gospel, every one of us has experienced this self-same thing. Yeah. That's it. Every one of us has. But, Here's what I want to qualify. But a mere law work, a mere law work is to no avail. We talk about be this a law work, but when I read Lamentations, I realized this is a God work. That's exactly right. Yes, sir. You understand what I'm saying now? Yes, sir. So it's not, well, we'll preach the law and this will bring men to the proper place. No, sir. No, sir. Uh -uh. This is a God work. Yes, sir. Our message is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Amen. That's what our message is. Yeah. And it's not a law work per se. It's got to be a God work. And why do I say that? Because Romans 2 verses 14 and 15 speak of a law work. God said, I've written the law in every man's heart. Yeah. It, doesn't He say that? Yeah. Yes, but it's of no true spiritual benefit to them. All they do is use it to either accuse or excuse one another. That's right. Right? Yeah. So just a mere law work ain't no good. Exactly. Right? John chapter 8, <coughs> verse 9. You remember? You remember what our Lord said? He that is without, without sin, let him cast the first stone. You remember that account? Yep. And it said, every one of them being convicted where? 
and their conscience, and their conscience in here, in here, they went away. But were they all saved? Did they all finally get it? That was a law work in the conscience, was it not? Yeah. They realized, wait a minute, I've done it too. I deserve to be there on my knees, hands and knees, beside that whore with rocks being cast at me too. That's right? right? Yeah. But did it change them and turn them toward God? No, they just walked away, didn't they? That's it. They dropped their stones per se and walked away. No, truly, God, God is at work here. Let's read it again. He hath. I'm going to read it. He hath. Isn't that what it says? He hath. He keeps saying it. He hath. Not the law did this. Jeremiah knew the law. Did he not? He was like Saul of Tarsus. But he says not the law's done this. No, who's done this? God has done this to me. Do you see that? Therein is the difference. I may do it to you. You may do it to yourself by reading the word. You may get it in Sunday school. And you may feel really bad about yourself. But you can't experience what Jeremiah experienced or what Paul experienced until God Almighty does it to you. Amen. How do I know that it's God that's doing this or, or, or done this to me? You look at the end results. There you go. But now I've done jump to the end of my message. <laughs> Truly, God is at work here. He's done this. He's done this. He's done this. He's done, isn't that what Jeremiah constantly yes, says? Sir. He's Amen. done this. What is this humbling work of God? Number one. This is number two. First one is truly humbling is God's work. Let us be careful we talk about a law work. Yeah. That we don't give people the long impre wrong impression of what we're talking about now. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. But what I'm trying to say is what this book is teaching here. Right. It's a God work. Yeah. They might not even know the law no. by Scripture. That's right. But God will use His law, even written in their hearts, to then, then begin to bring bondage and corruption and misery and to shut them in. Yes, sir. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. What is this? Now, it's number two. What is this humbling work of God? Number one. And we're going to look at each, uh, not each verse necessarily, but look at it. He brings home my personal condition. Yes, sir. That's humbling. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's humbling. Look at it. Look at it. Verse 1. I'm going to read them all over again. I've read it. I deserve wrath. Yes, sir. Jeremiah or Paul or neither, nobody, no, none of God's people, when God bring, when God starts this work on you, this God work on you, you're not going to say, well, wait a minute, I know what the doctrine is. If I'm one of the elect, I've never really been under the wrath of God. Therefore, if this is happening to me and I'm one of God's, then I'm really not under wrath anyway. Uh -uh. God's going to bring you that place to where, elect or not, I deserve wrath. Exactly. You understand what I'm saying? You ain't going to argue doctrine. You're going to experience the reality. God is holy, and I am unholy, and I deserve his wrath. That's it. That's it. That's humbling. That's a humbling work. But it doesn't stop there. A lot of people are afraid of wrath. They're afraid of hell. Doesn't it? But it kind of stops there. They make their decision for Jesus, and they're all fixed up. But it don't stop there. Exactly. You see, if this is really a work of God, it'll continue on. And I'm not saying there's necessarily a certain order here. I, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying God brings every one of his elect individually through this experience here. Amen. He brings home my personal condition. I deserve wrath. Number two, verse two, I am in darkness. He brings me to that. Yes, sir. God doesn't first bring you to light. He brings you to show you how dark you are. Exactly. That's right. yeah. He shows you, starts to show you how dark you really are. Verse 2. Number 3. Verse 6. I am death. Yeah. I am death. It's not just, well, I might die one day. Yeah. No, I am death. And, that, and that's what Paul said. When the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. died. Yeah, Look at it. Verse 6. He has set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. That's right. He put me in the grave. He made me realize where I really was. You see that? That's what he's talking about. Yes, sir. Number four, verse 17, no peace. Yeah. 
couldn't find it. Look at verse 17. And thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forget prosperity. You see that? Mm, Yeah. I can relate to that. I know what Jeremiah is talking about. I've been there. Here's the second thing. God shuts out my effort. That's humbling. That's humbling, isn't it? Look at it. Verse 7. I am burdened. You see it? Look at it. He hath hedged me about that I cannot get out. Do you see that? Yes, sir. He hath made my chain. I got a chain, but he made it what? Heavy. Do you see that? Heavy. He shuts out my effort. I am burdened. Also not. Verse 8. I am emptied. He emptied. Also, when I cry and shout, he shuts out my prayer. You see, every, read it. I make an effort, and what happens? God shuts me down. Do you see that? God shuts me down. Because God shuts out our effort. I'm emptied. Another one. A third thing. My efforts are even made perverse. Look at it, verse 9 and 11. He hath enclosed my, my ways with hewn stone. He hath made my path crooked. You see that? What is a crooked path but a perverse path? The easiest path is the straight way path. Straight. He made my path crooked. Look at verse 11. He hath turned aside my ways and pulled me in pieces. He hath made me desolate. Even when I act, it either falls apart in my hand or it smells of corruption and vileness before God. God shuts out my effort. That's humbling. (laughs) If God begins to bring you through that, it will begin to humble you. Yes, sir. Because that's the reason for it happening. Exactly. Here's another thing. God conquered my will. Yes, that's what Jeremiah says. God conquered my will. That's humbling. Amen. I mean, I, I, this is one I remember. Speci- I know I went through all these, but I look back now and I remember God conquering my will. Because I, fr- I was a free will worshiper at one time. I thought free will was the answer to every hard spot or hard question in Scripture. I did. That's what I was taught. And I'm not blaming those that taught me because I drank it up like water. I drank it up like water. He conquered my will. How do I know that? Look at verse 12. He hath bit his bow and set me as a mark for the arrow. He hath caused the arrow of his quiver to enter into my, what? My reins. There you go. See that? Yeah. My reins. He's conquered my will. That's humbling. Number four, God shuts my mouth yes, sir. and opens me up to repentance. Yes, sir. Verse 16, look at it. He hath also broken my teeth with gravel stone. Think about that. You ever put a, put a handful in there and start to talk. <laughs> See what happens. Yeah. God shut my mouth. That's what he's saying. Quit bragging on yourself and everything you set your hand or heart or mind to. That's where God brings you to. Amen. Yes, sir. He's filled. Let me find my spot again. Oh, I want to read it again. Look at verse 16. He hath also broken my teeth with gravel stones. He shut my mouth and he covered me with ashes. You know what that's a, you know what that is, isn't it? Repentance. Yes, sir. You see, when, and notice there is a progression here. Yes, sir. He's coming further and further up to this thing. Quit bragging on yourself yeah. because there's nothing to boast of. Amen. You see that? Yeah. Hmm? Number five, God weans me from me. Yes, sir. <laughs> God weans me from me. Verses 17 through 19. And thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. I forget prosperity. Now that's not just talking about having money in your pocket. He's talking about soul prosperity. I'm dead broke. I got nothing to offer to God. 
You see it? He's removed my soul far off from peace. I forget prosperity. And I say it. Now notice something's yeah. changed. Yes, sir. Now, and Jeremiah, I said, my strength and my hope is perished. My strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Remembering my affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall. Hmm? That, my friends, is humbling and I say that not just from a doctrine, though it is a doctrine, but I say that from experience because I know what Jeremiah is talking about. Yes, sir. Yes. I've been there. God, I didn't decide to go there. No. When it started to happen, I didn't want to be there. Exactly. But thank okay. God he brought me under these things. Amen. Huh? Yes, sir. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Now let me say, to this humility, there is no shortcut. This is number three. We're getting near the end. There is no shortcut to this humility. A lot of people want a shortcut. Get it right now. Come to Jesus. Just give your heart to him. It's all over. It don't work that way. I'm just saying it don't work that way. Yeah. Now, if God's brought you to where you can say up to verse 18 and 19, I've been there. I say flee to Christ. Amen. I say run to him. Amen. But until God brings you through verses 1 through 18 and 19, you ain't ready to come to Christ. Exactly. Now, you hear what I said? Yeah. There you go. You ain't ready yeah. to come to Christ. There was a member of the rich young ruler. He wasn't ready to come to Christ. Was he? Because there was things he valued far more than Christ. Wasn't it? He went away sorrowful for he had great riches. Wasn't it? The, the Christ said, give everything you've got. Sell it all and give it to the poor. Can that really save you? No. But Christ knew those things were more important to him than following Christ. He said, take up your cross, follow me. That's right. <coughs> you know, he knew he wasn't ready. Exactly. Didn't he? Now, I can't look at any individual and say, I know. But let me tell you, you're not ready until you go through verses. God brings you through verses 1 through verse 19. You ain't ready yet. There is no shortcut to this humility. Exactly. The end is only reached by the humbling experience of the whole. Verse 19, remembering. You see that? You can't remember where you've never been. You can't remember what's never happened, can you? That's right. You can't. We're made that way. God made us that way for a reason. Why? So he gets all the glory. Amen. That's why you go through this experience. So that all the glory and honor, you don't just give it to him with lip service. You know he gets all the glory and the honor down in here because it's all of God. It's all of God. The end is only reached by the humbling experience of the whole. Remembering my affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall. But listen to me. There's the second part here. This, there's no shortcut to this humility. I never grow beyond its memory. And that's a good thing. No, we don't go through this over and over and over. But you never get beyond its memory. Look, my soul hath them still in remembrance. Yeah. Now this, I'm not going through it now. Now, there may be times you may experience a, a thing or this or that. You know what? But initial conversion, God brings you through this right here. Yes, sir. This bondage. This bondage of fear. Where your hope's even gone from before the Lord. Oh, yeah. My soul hath them still in remembrance and is humbled yes, in me. Do you see that? I never grow beyond its memory. Joe quoted it. And I don't have it here, but I remembered it. And I was going to mention it, so I will again. He says, remember the pit from which you were digged. Amen. Not from which you digged yourself out. God dug you out of the pit. Yeah. But listen, you're in the pit for a reason. That's right. So that when the digging starts, you'll realize, my God, this is God doing this. <laughs> You've scratched and dug at the walls of that pit all your life, maybe. Or at least most of your life and couldn't get nowhere. All you did was make the pit worse. Yeah. What? And then God dug you out of it. And then he says, remember it. Remember it. And thirdly, there is, there is no shortcut to this humility. The end result 
is hope in God's immutable mercy and compassion. Verse 21, this I recall to mind, therefore have I hope. But where is that hope? It is of the Lord's mercies. We are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Amen. Do you see that? They are new every morning. Thank, aren't you glad you don't have to go through verses 1 through 19 every morning? But thank God, thank God, what? Every morning his compassions are new and great is his faithfulness. He that hath begun a good work in you, he'll perform it. How long? Until the day of Jesus Christ. Once he starts it, if he started it, you'll get to the end. Now if he didn't start it, you may find yourself sidetracked somewhere along the line. You see what I'm saying? How do I know, though, I've really, that's happened to me. Can, can you say, can you now say, this I recall to mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that I am not consumed, because his compassions fail not. No, the end result is hope in God's immutable mercy and compassion. How, am, how mutable am I? If it, took, if it depended upon me to get to this place and even stay there, I'm a goner. You're right. I'm a goner. But if God does it, those that walk in pride, he is, what? Able to abase. And God, remember, God abases a man before he lifts him up in Christ. Amen. He always does. He always puts you down first and lets you see where you really are before he lets you hope in where God purposed the people to be in Christ. Yes, sir. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, the end result is hope in God's immutable mercies and compassion. From bondage, from corruption, from hopelessness to hope. Real, bona fide hope. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. There was a hope I had before, yeah. but God calls me to see that one. That wasn't worth spit. Yeah. Well, spit. Yeah. Spit's worth something. It's worse than spit. Exactly. That's it. The end result is hope in God Himself. Amen. Look at it. The Lord is my portion. Amen. Do you see that? That's it. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Notice he's got something talking to him. It's his soul. Uh, it's the new man crying out, yeah, he's my portion. Amen. Amen. He's my portion. There's a part of you that says, well, I don't know about all this. Exactly. Uh, but your soul says, he is the Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I, the real me, the me, I'll hope in him. Right? The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait. Amen. Now, I'm not telling anybody, wait to come to Christ. If, if you've experienced what Jeremiah is talking about here. Exactly. But I'm here to tell you this. If you've not experienced what Jeremiah is talking about, you can't relate to what Jeremiah is saying, you can come all day long. You're becoming to a figment of your imagination because you don't truly know the Lord of glory until the Lord of glory arrests you where you are. That's what it is. Why was that blind man given sight? Because the Lord of glory was there. Wasn't he? Yes, sir. It wasn't up to that blind man to do anything. But let me tell you, once God acted on him, yep. God would not let it go. Yeah, that's right. Would he? Yes, he, he left that man, and that man fell into trouble, didn't he? I'm sorry, Joe, but I've got to preach on that some more. He fell into trouble. And what, Christ came back and said, I'm the one. That's right. You're seeing him and hearing him. Amen. Uh -huh. Isn't that the way God works? Yep. The end result is what? It's hope in God himself. Yes, sir. It's not hope, well, oh, I've, I've had that experience and then live in that experience. No, no. No, no. Hope in Him. Amen. Hope in Him. To summarize, let me put it this way. Christ preach causes remembrance. Yeah. It'll cause you to remember back yonder. Won't it? Yeah. It'll cause you to remember. Christ preach causes remembrance. Christ preach instills constant humility. Christ preached.
constrains us to constant hope in him and in him alone. The last thing is, this is the humble soul's confession. Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Amen. And when he says to you, I will, bless God, you will be clean. Amen. You will be clean. Why? Because he'll even touch you that's right. if that's what it takes to do it. Yes, sir. Matter of fact, look at it. Look at it. He, 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 you know, it's like, it's like taking your head and pushing it down into the muck of where you really are. Huh? Before he even lets you begin to gaze up at the glory of Christ. Huh? That's why God does it. You don't come to Christ chewing, chewing gum and just, oh, how great things are. And then later begin to realize how bad you are. God's going to show you how bad you are and you're going to run to Jesus Christ. Amen. In your heart and mind, you're going to flee to him. Why? Because that's the way God saves sinners. That's the way God humbles a soul. Yes, sir. So that is, it is, not ought to be, not might be, that is the confession of a humbled soul. Amen. My question I have to ask me is, have I truly been here? You see that? Have I truly been here? Father, thank you for your grace and mercy. The, re the revealing power of your spirit and the detailing power of your word. Lord, thank you for your mercy and your compassion that are new every morning. Your faithfulness toward your covenant and your son and his person and work. I, I, I thank you with these feeble lips of clay. In Christ's name, amen.